Awesome. I think it's a good time to pray before we start. Lord, it is an amazing day to be here today. We are able to be here with those, with, with everyone who is following you. And we pray that this morning is a place where you are lifted up, where you are glorified. We have a hope in you that we cannot find anywhere else and we need to be reminded of that. So Father, may this morning be a time where we are encouraged and built up by each other, but by you as well. Through your spirit, speaking to our spirit and reminding us that we are your children, that we are, you, we are your heirs and that you are our solid foundation that we can live our life on. Despite the challenges that may come up, we know that there are blessings as well because this is the day that you have made. So we thank you for it and the opportunity to be here together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I want to pray for, I want to lift up those who are in the middle of, I don't know what. But there are people who are struggling, who are hurting, who are in a dark place today. And we know that your promise isn't to take those things away, that you will actually lead us through them. And we don't always know how to help. A lot of the time we don't. bring them to you now and we lay them before you. And let them know that you see their hurt. You see the wounds that are there, some which are quite deep. Remind them of your love this morning. that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. And if there's words for us to say or simply for us to be there and to be present, then Lord, lead us to that. Because we know that pain and injury, this was not part of your original design. We are flawed human beings with a broken image in us. And we need you to set that right. So we lay these people at your feet this morning. Some who may not even want to do that for themselves. Who may be struggling to see you. Help us to keep believing for them until they can believe again for themselves. You are the God who heals, you are the God who saves, and you are the God who loves and is always present. And there are some here this morning who need to be reminded of that, especially. So we pray for them that in their darkness, your light would still shine into their hearts and through us as well. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. And we don't just see ourselves, we see God for who he really is. On this day where we celebrate fathers, he is the ultimate father. The one who loves and heals and binds up the broken and brings back those who wander away. So Lord, we are here in your presence, in your mercy and your grace this morning. We ask for a fresh renewing of your spirit, whether that's a reminder to our minds or a reminder through your presence to our hearts. We need you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Rightio, the kids are on their way out. We pray that they have not just a good time, but a, a time where the seeds are sown into their lives to equip them for their future that God has for them. And we pray for the leaders, that they survive it as well. Uh, it's, it's a good team out there. Well, I can't believe I'm standing here again. I'm sure this week was like three days long. And now we're at Exodus chapter 3. We're going through a series, and the good thing about having life just chaos and busy is I know what to preach on next when I do a series, so you just stuck with it. Um, I, I felt bad this morning. I woke up and I was saying, oh, I really haven't spent the time with this chapter like I did the others, and God, I just got... You know, I'm tired. It's been a big week. We've had weddings and all the different stuff going on. Laser tag. I can hardly walk. <laughs> the youth on Friday night in our paddock. Um, yesterday wasn't so bad. Then it's the second day, you, your joints just freeze up. Um, that's what happens at 42, I guess. Uh, oh, are you 82 year olds? Anyway. <clears throat> okay. Let's go straight to Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Um, actually, let's, I'll read it straight through in case this sermon is too short. Um, let's read it together so you've got the picture in your head. Now Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush. Moses, Moses, Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said, take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave, of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Hittites, no, that's right. I thought it was too many T's. Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, I hate that name, it's like, seem to be the guys that cling on to you. Hivites and the Jebusites. Verse 9. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to them and say, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Last verse. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So I've got some feedback from our previous sermons, and, and some, even particular last week, it didn't look like there was much substance in those 15 verses, but... It's all in there, right? I've been watching scholars. I think I may have mentioned this a couple of sermons ago. Um, they're clinical psychologists, and most of them have done Harvard and Oxford, and they're um, multiple doctorates and 
all these kind of people. Dennis Prager, you might have heard of that guy. His knowledge of the Hebrew Bible is really, I mean, wouldn't you love to tap into a bit of that? And he, he interrupts these guys over every few lines. It's like, I'll tell you what this means to the Hebrew people. Or this is how we know. He says, I'm sorry to labor this point, which means I'm sorry to be sounding like a broken record, but this is how we know that God wrote this. It doesn't make sense in any other way but a divine text, he says, because of the way this part was written. Because the Jewish people wouldn't even write it like this. It doesn't make sense to them and it challenges them and, and the way it all fits together. So there's something about the first, in particular, five books. They call it the, the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first, the beginning of the Bible is profound. I was talking to somebody I think it was we were here for prayer on Thursday and uh, someone they met a pastor I think in, in a certain denomination not this one and said oh we just disregard the Old Testament because it's just so not the God we know <laughs> and I was like that's right you don't know him very well at all <laughs> man it's that's terrible um, you don't know a thing about the story of Christ without the backstory of what we're looking at so anyway, let's go to verse 1. We'll bring it up on the screen. We, uh, we go through this. I don't have a lot of notes, but we'll see what God brings. If you've got your Bibles with you, open them up, put an asterisk, do a mark, write something in the margins. You'll find things more than I've found as we go through this. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So he's been doing this for a few decades now. He's got a new family in the chapter before. Um, he's got a, a baby boy at least. I don't know if there's others that we probably have multiple kids now that are not mentioned just yet. But he's pretty much a shepherd. So what a transition from the life he had growing up in, well, for the first his childhood, six years uh, with his mother, the Hebrew people in the slave scene. But he was also overseen and take care, taken care of by the, the daughter of Pharaoh. And then at, as he came to be an older child, he lived in that temple. And what a contrast that would have been. Now he's lost everything like we looked at last week. And he's just wandered off for his life. Wandered off at a pace probably because Pharaoh was after him. Remember, he rescued these ladies at a well. He found himself at a well, which is where you go when you want to survive. It's the only place of water. And he rescued these seven girls. So he was in the good box with their dad, and now he's got a wife. But the, the story, as we begin to see the character of Moses, he was a tough dude. And you can see why God chose him. And we're going to see in these verses, like, it's no accident. And Moses says, why would you choose me? He's wired for this. His story laid out has all been part of God's plan. And for 400 years of their slavery, he's been waiting for the right person. That's him. Moses doesn't know it yet, what he's in for. But I wonder, because we're actually, I mean, Moses is a special dude. We read about him. And, but God sees us all as equal. What does God have in store for us? What does our backstory or the potential crisis, possible crisis we're in right now, that is shaping us for what we need to be for him in the future? Moses would have rewritten his story completely different. Probably wouldn't have involved 40 years in the desert and running for his life and losing everything he had. But this is the moment where God goes, all right, it's time for the calling. And he's gone way off the other side of the desert, which is probably key. There's something, maybe he didn't go there all the time. It's a bit of a harsh season. He had to travel a fair way to feed his sheep. And here he is at Mount Horeb, which they, they called the mountain of God. Um, I'm not sure what significance it had before then, but today it's significant. Verse 2, there, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Have you ever heard Ken Davis's take on this? He's a Christian comedian from when I was a kid. 
He's like, this is a butane bush, the first of its kind. It's like the gas is, but it didn't seem to perish. And if you read the, um, new, the old King James Version, it's, it's quite profound. You see the Charlton Heston come out. He sees this bush as he, behold, the bush burneth, yet is not consumedeth. Oh my God, I think that's how he said it. He's like, what? What is that? Now, God's used a scenario or a scene that a shepherd would have been familiar with a bush on fire. In fact, that's how he kept warm every night. Isn't it interesting? He sort of used something from nature, but, and, but there's also something very unique about this, and it drew Moses' attention. It says in verse 3, Moses thought, I shall go and inquire hitherto, or wherever he says it. I want to go over and see what this weird thing is. Why does it not burn up? Is, has titanium been invented or what is this? But as we sit and think of this scenario, he's, he's kind of passing by. And as the sheep are feeding, he's continually on the move. And God knows that. So he draws, he catches his attention. And there's something in that Moses' posture towards this moment. He stops and he actually leaves what he's tending. He's, he's gone off his routine now and he's moved into what is this? Now, when the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God responds. So if you look at it closely, it says the angel of the Lord is in the bush, right? So he's, yeah, that's pretty special. But until Moses stops and turns and draws his full attention to this, it's not actually God. It's like God's going to go, I want to see if he even notices before I do the next step. So I guess the question today is how set are you in your ways? If God's going... Look at me, hey, hey, over here, hey, hey. And you're just so, even intent on ministry, even intent on doing the things of God. It's like, I've got to keep pressing in. I've got to keep my quiet times and my reading and my, my devotions and all this. And God's going, yeah, it's about me. I want to tell you something. Oh, Lord, just tell me, talk to me. Lord, talk to me. What is that? It's annoying. Will we stray from what we know and feel secure in, or think is what he wants us to do, if he should call us out of that. If he should call us to, well, Moses has been through the desert experience. This is the next season now. I have something for you. You have no clue what it is. We all have a plan for our future. I, I think our property is going to be set up as a ministry place, and we want to be able to help people and restore broken people and, and all this kind of stuff, and God's going... Do you want to hear what I reckon you could do? Do you want to hear how every moment of those key things in your childhood shaped you for something that you haven't thought of yet? When the Lord saw that he had turned and gone over for a look, he then calls to him. So it's no longer the angel of the Lord, it's the, Lord, the God himself. He calls from within the bush. What did this sound like to hear your name? It happened to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Now it's Moses, Moses. Well, this is first. But anyway. But only when he turned aside did God speak to him. Only when he stopped from what he was doing was God actually able to say, All right, you ready? Moses said, Here am I. Here I am. Just like the other prophets, like I mentioned, Samuel. He gives God his full attention. The sheep are probably freaked out and run away because it's like there's a fire and they don't want to know anything about that. Rather than trying to rationalize what he's seeing, I think so many of us are too smart for our own good. And maybe Moses wasn't, but 
I don't know. He certainly makes excuses that he's not equipped for this. But I think some of us see something of God. He's getting our attention. And then we try and rationalize. It's like, wow, this is amazing. I've had this epiphany. Now I'm going to unpack it and I'm going to read commentaries about it. I'm going to journal. And they may be good things. But what if God's just saying, hey, Michelle, Mark, June, I've got something to tell you. And you're like, oh, this is interesting. All the stuff I'm learning, everything I'm going to be able to share with everybody else. He's like, shh. I'm talking to here in you, not here. Rather than examining and taking notes, I'm going to take a sample of this bush, run it through the lab, figure out what maketh it burneth and not consumeth us. He shuts up and listens. So that he can hear and learn. Not hear and absorb information and knowledge, but learn and be affected in his heart when God speaks. Can we do that? Are we more interested in taking notes so you can quote spiritual wisdom and help everyone else when God's like, I want to start with you? The best way that we're going to minister to others is when we go through it ourselves. Because they know it's real then. You can read every book, but until you're living what's in the pages, people won't even open up to you. <clears throat> Verse 5. Do not come any closer, God said. This is interesting. He's like Moses. He's inviting him in. And he's like, God, it's got two personalities. Whoa, not too close. What is that? He says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. What makes this ground holy? Was there something special about the sand? I don't think so. It's that God was there. God's presence made it holy. Which actually means anywhere and any time can be holy ground. So please don't ever wear shoes from now on. I was thinking about this. What does it mean? Is this symbol of the sandal something that we, and maybe it's not, but I actually thought if God can speak to us anywhere, anytime, and it can be holy ground, but we're too preoccupied in the first place, like we mentioned, but then too insulated from it, like when we wear things on the sole of our feet, there's no connection with the ground. We're too insulated to know his presence. I thought of Adam and Eve walking in the garden before the fall. That's, can you imagine what that would have been like? Moses becomes the closest thing to that in walking and talking with God, spending time with him on the mountain. But Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden until their sin insulated them from his presence. They never wore sandals till after that, I bet. And then they actually not only put clothes on, but they had to hide their face. And that's what Moses does in this next verse. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, these three names Moses would have known. He's like, whoa, this is not just some kind of spirit thing or whatever that knows my name. This is the God mum told me about. Then he hides his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, if you notice the three names, they're mentioned all the way through the book. And I think there's significance that I don't even understand fully. I haven't looked into it that much at all. But even this morning, I was thinking this, the names mentioned, the Abraham is the call to adventure. I'm taking you out of your land and I'm taking you somewhere different. And you're going to have to trust me because you're going to have no idea where it's going. And then his son Isaac, the story with him, part of that is like, I will be the connection you need. I will provide the sacrifice. And then again, the next one down, Jacob, through the, him, the 12 tribes appear. There's so much in this, you could probably unpack and do a three-part series on perhaps. Um, but this is the full story playing out in these three characters where and Jacob says, you're going to be, he says to Jacob, I'm going to call you Israel and I'm going to 
um, invite you to be part of a family that you have no idea how big it's going to get and what you're going to be called to, but you're going to belong and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And that's the third part of that. Now God has even made that his name, just so you know who he is. Remember, I called you, I provided for you and I have a plan for you. Verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt and I've heard them crying out because they're slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. I like that. It's like, wow. Imagine you heard God say that. I'm about to do something big and I'm going to do it, God says. We were like, yes. He's going to be the best at it. I'm just going to sit back. Actually, on this mountain, probably be able to see it from here if it's God. How good is this? He's just told me. I don't know why. He could have just done it, but thanks for letting me know. I've got a front row seat now. I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good, spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Why milk and honey? I guess there's something about sustenance and sweetness and symbolism there, but you don't want that everywhere. That's pretty messy. But anyway, it's something funny in the way this is described of the promised land. Others might say, can I have a land of chocolate and fizzy drink or something like that? Luxuries. Luxuries and sustenance, I guess is what he's on about. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. There's five different, six different places mentioned. So God comes to rescue them, but there's a catch. And why does God function like this? I think it's one of the great mysteries. Why doesn't he just sort stuff out? Because we're useless at being any help. But the next verse says, The cry of Israelites has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, he's like, what? I'm sending you. Moses is like, I'm sorry, I misheard that. You said you were going to do something cool, and then you just said, I'm doing it. There's something clearly flawed in this plan, Lord. (laughs) You're probably a better option. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Whatever God calls us to, it's probably not something we're going to choose for ourselves. It's something bigger than us. And as if you're in leadership, there's a weight to that. And people who are super keen and looking for that perhaps don't know what they're actually asking. Anyway, verse 11, God, Moses says back to God, Why me? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And I don't know if there's more dialogue than what we're reading because he could have told the story and made Moses a bit more confident. Remember you're in the basket? Remember everyone your age was dead, little boys? Remember you were rescued? Remember your mum got paid to look after you? Remember you were raised with all, everything you could ever want? Every luxury? You know about the Hebrews, you know about the Egyptians, you're the, the link. You're the bridge between these two. You're the connection, you're the man. You're a man of justice, you'll fight when things are wrong. I need that kind of man. Seems a legitimate question, and he was qualified really, but he certainly didn't think so. He wants the details before he agrees to anything, I guess, and that's probably what we want. But the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Can you imagine he gave you the details for the next 40 years? I'd be rushing ahead. I would completely mess it up, especially when he's still working on me to teach me things that I'm going to need to know. We do the same. God's 
vision for us, his journey for us is not something to be taken lightly. Yep, God, whatever you want. We say that. Oh, I'm fully yours, God. I surrender all. I'll go to the ends of the earth for you. It's easier to say in a revival tent, tent isn't it? <clears throat> and he goes, all right, where's the worst place you can think of? Would you go there? God said, verse 12, Here's the compromise. I'll be with you. Which actually means God's still doing it, but he's using Moses to do it. And I think that's part of our story. He's wanting to do stuff, but he says, you're coming with me. And I will be with you. Therefore, you don't have to be afraid. I know we've seen all these images of our vision of Jesus, the paintings on our wall are just, I can't wait to see him for real. Because he's not just blonde hair, hair, blue eyes, sitting in the paddock picking flowers with little kids. He's the one that we could walk with like as if we were this big and he was this big and he's holding our hand like this. If you could actually see his presence with you, which is real, his Holy Spirit's in you. Why are we afraid? It's because we've forgotten he's there. And when we realize he's there, we will just keep walking into the most chaotic, dangerous situations or the most potentially damaging scenarios if we get it wrong. But if he's leading us, it'll be more than okay. In fact, we'll bring healing and light and life to those places that we would avoid if we were on our own. I'm preaching today. I think I'm talking to myself. It's not, I don't have any notes either. It's, we appreciate God speaking through his word. This is what these scholars are saying. This is divine text. God wrote this for you. He wrote it for me. I sound like one of those Pentecostal guys. I'm preaching now. I don't ever want to be that. So. I'll be with you. This will be the sign. It's like, okay, I'll give you something. But this sign is actually for the future. This sign will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you brought the people out of Egypt. You, which is actually the plural word, all y'all are going to worship right here. This is going to stay holy ground. That's how you know I sent you which is all well and good, but he needs to know before then, right? Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? When you think about the situation of the Israelites, they've been about 400 years living in slavery. So most likely they don't even know God anymore. They're so stuck and in survival mode. What am I going to tell them? Because you could say God and they might even think of Pharaoh now. Because they thought Pharaoh was a God in the Egyptian circles and traditions. And their main story was yet to be written. They haven't really understood God, but they're about to. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. I love this. It's like even Jesus said it. Do you remember in the garden? You couldn't get a more basic statement. When, G, when, people, when the guys, soldiers came in the garden, they were looking for Jesus. We're looking for Jesus. Are you he? And he goes, you can't get two shorter words. One word is one letter. The next word is two letters in our language. I am. And they go, <laughs> fall backwards. I would have run a mile if I was one of those soldiers, but they weren't allowed to because they were soldiers. Whoever this I am is, he's big. He knows who he is. We need to know who he is. He doesn't need to give himself all these fancy names because no name under heaven 
could even describe his majesty power. Love, grace, omnipotence, omnipresence, all those things we try and make words that are infinite and big, but even that, our brains can't comprehend. I am who I am. I'm not going to give you a resume. You're here because of me. You exist because of me. This is what you had to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I would like to know what that sounded like to a Hebrew person because it, it must mean more to them than it does to us. Verse 15, it's the last verse. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham again, Isaac and Jacob, the three, has sent me to you. So he does give him a bit more detail. He's like, yeah, you're right. Maybe I am isn't quite convincing enough. But this is my name forever, the name that you shall call me from generation to to generation and I think we can learn that too it's the same God we worship I don't know and you don't know what God has called you to or has in your future and many of us do a Jonah and go, yeah, well, I'm not doing that. In fact, I have enough smarts about me to head in the opposite direction and you'll never get me to do it. Do you want the big fish experience? I <laughs> That's just the worst. I want to meet Jonah one day, walk up to him and go, probably not. In fact, I think I'll have a lot of respect for him because his story is teaching us that we don't want to try and dodge God. It doesn't go well. You're running from your very identity and your very purpose. So stop and stop taking notes so you can learn more, so you can protect yourself more or whatever. Just ask, Lord, speak. Here I am. Your servant is listening. And then when he speaks, you're probably not going to like at the first moment what he says. But the second thing he says, and I'll be with you. It's exciting, but it's terrifying. And there are way more people in this room than the 12 that Jesus started with who had less clue than we did. What would he do with us? But what hardships is he going to let us go through so that we're ready when the burning bush is in front of us? It's exciting. And I love to hear when God speaks to you. But if you're like we were praying earlier, we know people that are nowhere near even able to recognize the burning bush because you can't see it. You can't see any future. Lean on those who are a step ahead. Lean on those who have faith when you don't. We'll finish with a prayer. We'll get the band up. This last song is a celebration and I, I really hope that there's a heaviness to this message but it shouldn't stay that way. You know what I mean? Because he's asking us to do something heavy but he's saying, but oh, I'm with you and this is what you're wired for and anything else will be far less and you don't want that. You want me. Let's do it. Let's go together. And as a church, we're going to rub shoulders with each other. Come up, band, and we're going to sing. It's like pretty much the gospel in a lively song. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry, drink of the water thirst no more because he will satisfy when you come to the table come find his mercy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for even though you don't know what it is yet lord we just want to pray that these words from this ancient text that have spoken to people for thousands of years will 
resonate with us, that we will just come and sit at your feet. And you won't just give us more information and instructions of what to do next or what to learn, but you will pierce through the hard shell of our self and speak to our heart and say, I need to hit the reset on, on what you think is you. I want a new creation to be evident. I've done it for you spiritually. I want to do it with your mind. I want to do it with your heart. I want to bring healing and restoration to your body, perhaps. It's your story. Will you be quiet enough to listen? Will you notice when he attracts your attention and will you say, here I am, Lord, speak? And it's very hard not to keep talking back over him. Oh, yeah, I think I get it now. Keep listening. Be quiet and still. Because the adventure that's await, that awaits is more than we can comprehend. Thank you, Lord, that this is our story, that you're inviting us, you've designed. In Jesus' name, amen. God so loved the world. God, you tell us that you sent your one and only son to save us, that when we come to you, there is no condemnation. And we have seen today that we are we're all broken, we are all human, we are all flawed, and yet you are still calling out to each one of us. May we have our quiet spirits and quiet minds and our eyes fixed on you as the God of love to hear what you are saying, even in the midst of everything going on that we will be listening to you and following you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being in. Oh, oh, hello. We've got someone going rogue. Okay. It's on. Uh, I had an old friend, and he said to me, Lionel, you analyse things too much. And if you analyse things too much, you'll talk yourself out of what God's saying to you. So let God be God. Let him do his things. Amen. Let God be God. Let he be who he is. Have a blessed week. Thanks for being here and joining us for worship and for church. Have a cuppa afterwards. And-